Hey, howdy everyone. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get into the topic around bias. It's the bad B word in statistics, bias. And so we'll talk about how we deal, what's the cause of bias within our sample sets, how we can treat bias either by cell-based or some type of form of declustering, where we try to weight our data in order to weight our way out of the problem, or how do we de-bias, maybe using some type of secondary information to be able to assess us in removing bias. Okay, so let's talk about bias. Here's an example right here. So as I said in class, I've granted you the superhuman power to be able to see the truth model. This is a 1,000 by 1,000 meter subsurface unit of rock in which we have a porosity measure at a pretty high resolution over that entire space. And, and you have superhuman power. You can see the porosity at all possible locations. And so now I'll tell you that's what's going on. That's the true porosity at each location. And these circles are where you actually sample. And so now what's wrong with this sample set? Is there any problems with this sample set? Is there the potential for a sampling bias issue? If you look really carefully, what you'll see is that we have a regular pattern of sampling, which is good. That's good to have a regular pattern of samples. But there are specific locations where the samples are missing. Here, 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 here here, here, and so forth. And if you look, systematically, those samples are missing from the darker colors, from the more blue, dark shades. And those are the low porosity values. And so if you were to use, in fact, use these sample data to assess the average porosity over the entire reservoir, and then if you were to use that in order to try to assess the amount of oil in place or the value of that subsurface, you would find that you in fact would be biased high. You would be estimating too high and that would be a problem if you're trying to make decisions. You would make the wrong decisions and this could be, this could actually be a significant bias. So what's the source of bias? What causes bias? So you could imagine that we have a reservoir and you could imagine that we sampled this reservoir at specific locations. Here, 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 and here. Now, if you looked at that data set and I said, okay, can we use that data set in order to assess the average of porosity or permeability or gold grade or any type of property, spatial property of interest, would you think that was sufficient? And so this is about a thousand meters. This is about a thousand meters. We've got four samples. And so in general, we'd say, well, there's just too few samples. We don't have enough information. We don't have a reliable estimate of what's going on here. And so maybe we had additional samples available to us here, here, and here, and excuse my drawing here. And maybe we put one out here and we go here and we go here and we go here. How about now? You'd probably start feeling a little more comfortable that we know what's going on here in the subsurface. And so you could imagine that that would be maybe a reasonable sampling. It's, it's still a large area and, and very few samples, but we're getting something that could be helpful now. Now imagine if we started to see things like this happen, where we have a specific location where the samples are denser. Would you be comfortable with using the equal weighted average of all of those samples to assess the average over this entire reservoir? You'd be concerned because you see that the data is starting to be gathered at a much greater density in a specific part of the reservoir. And so we'd be concerned about what's going on there. What if you found out that that location of the reservoir specifically at high values, and everything outside of that tended to have lower values. 
then we'd really be concerned. Then we'd be very suspicious of using the raw statistics from this naive data, from this data as is, in order to formulate any statistics whatsoever. We should be probably pretty concerned. In fact, what would happen if we kept drilling? I love good news. I love lots of good news. And I know if I keep drilling in this area, I'm going to keep getting good news. What will happen? Every time I drill another well and I put it into the average, the overall average is going to keep going up. In fact, it would keep, keep going up, up, up. But have I learned anything new about the estimate for this entire reservoir? No, I haven't. In fact, much of this data is likely redundant with each other. They're not really telling me anything new about the reservoir. If I wanted to know something new, maybe I'd drill out here where I have sparser information. All right, so this is fundamentally some of the concepts or ideas behind bias and why we would be concerned about specifically about just using raw sample data sets to formulate statistics. So let's go and talk about why we expect to see bias within our data sets and our spatial data sets. Data is collected to answer questions. That's why we do data collection. We're trying to answer questions. Specifically, we want to know how far does the contaminant plume extend. So we want to know how far this plume extends. We're going to sample the peripheries of the plume. We're going to try to sample the margins and figure out where it's gone, where it's not gone. Where is the fault? We're going to drill based on a seismic interpretation. We're going to drill where we think the fault is. Can we detect the fault? We're going to try to determine, answer that question because that's important. The fault might be sealing. It might be major discontinuity if there's an offset or throw on it. And so we're trying to understand, you know, how those features in the subsurface impact our ability to develop assets within the subsurface. What is the highest mineral grade? What is the highest porosity? What's the thickest part of the reservoir? We often sample the best part. We want to understand the high side because that can very much drive economics of subsurface development. And how far does the reservoir extend? How far does the gold deposit extend? How far do we have an aquifer of water that we need to develop? We're going to do offset drilling from available data to try to assess that. And so you see in every one of these cases, we have a question and we gather data to answer that question. That's what we're doing on the subsurface. In addition to that, data collection is often a byproduct of us trying to develop the subsurface. When we drill a production well in the subsurface, we log the well, we get data from the well, but the reason we drilled the well was to maximize production, to get production. We drill a well to inject to support production or something like that, enhanced oil recovery and so forth. We are gathering data effectively to optimize net present value of an operation. The driver is economics. There's also limits to our data collection. We can't, we don't have superhuman powers to be able to go to any spot in the reservoir and say, I want to know what's going on there. There can sometimes be accessibility issues, obstructions. We may be challenged to have reliable drilling in a certain part of the field. We may be trying to image subsalt in part of the field and part of, in other parts of the field we don't have the salt shadow. So we may have limits in our ability to gather data. It's not malicious. We're not trying to sample certain parts and not sample other parts. We're just unable to do it. In fact, it can go even further. Maybe we have a case where we're trying to, we'd be interested in knowing what the permeability or the rock properties of shale are, or to even have shale data, but maybe we're unable to recover shale cores because they don't have the rock strength to basically survive the recovery process in peace. And so it's not useful or fruitful to us to waste our time trying to cover shale samples. We may not have the time to run the experiment. We may want to calculate permeability, but in very low permeability shale, we just don't have the time to conduct the experiment required to be able to observe reliably those very low permeabilities. And so there might be all kinds of limitations based on obstruction, our ability to recover samples, our ability to measure from those samples that may be impacting overall our data collection process or practice. So because of all of these, the way that we sample and gather data, we expect bias. 
Now, what if you came in with your beret on and you're like, I'm going to change it. I'm going to make sure all the data is representative. I can calculate statistics directly from it. What's the answer? Well, statistical theory gives you two options, only two options. You can do random sampling. You can run if every location within the subsurface has equal probability of being sampled. That would be your fastest route to getting representative statistics. As long as you have enough samples that you can observe the phenomenon, you'd be in pretty good shape. Regular sampling can happen due to certain types of exploitation schemes or you know development plans and so forth. We can have an almost regular sampling, it doesn't? But we have to also be careful with regular sampling because we could be aligned to some natural periodicity of the natural phenomenon. And the result is we still may have a bias. So now ask yourself, given our knowledge about statistical theory, what would happen if you walked into your boss's office, you're working in the Gulf of Mexico, you're on the subsurface asset team, and you say, I propose the next $150 million well drilled in deep water to a deep objective should be drilled based on random selection. That would be ridiculous. It would be a very bad day at work, to say the least. We should not change the current sampling methodologies. They result in the best economics to answer the questions that help us develop the subsurface in the best manner possible. What does that mean? Take your beret off. You're not going to change the data collection practices. In spatial, in the spatial context of the subsurface, we've got to deal with the data as is most of the time. And so what does it what are we going to do? What are we going to do to fix this? We're going to say never use the raw data without assessing sampling bias and trying to do something to mitigate to correct that. And so that this, this entire discussion right now is around what we can do. And so there is a need to try to fix statistics. That includes the entire histogram, the distribution, the CDF, the summary statistics, whatever you need to support decision making. Those statistics need to be treated. We need to correct for potential biases. We need to look at them. What are our technologies that we're going to discuss here today to be able to address that? Well, we got declustering methods that assign weights to each one, each datum, and that this is based on the distance or closeness to the surrounding data. The weights will typically be greater than zero on those sum to n, where n is the number of data. And once you've done that, What's really cool is that when you're calculating histograms and cumulative probability distribution functions and so forth, you can go ahead and you can use those weights instead of what we've been doing already, which is assuming equal weighted. In fact, if you think about the way we calculated CDFs back in the good old days, if you can remember of um, CDFs and PDFs, we were sorting the data in ascending order, and then we were calculating a cumulative probability, usually assuming a i, or index of the data, in ascending order, divided by n plus 1. And that was assuming we didn't know the tails, you know, yada yada, remember that, right? So, in that method, we assumed that every data was equally weighted. They all increased at the exact same weight. So, now we have weights with declustering, and we can use those weights in order to build CDFs and all the summary statistics and percentiles and skew and so forth using the weights in a way that we're accounting for the fact that data is biased. Debiasing techniques are another type of methodology where we can derive an entirely new distribution, not weighting the data, but building a brand new distribution given knowledge or information coming from a secondary source of information that has better coverage, a relationship between our primary variable and our secondary variable, and so this might include using information like geophysical measurements, expert interpretations, and so forth. So let's start. Let's talk about this. Let's show an example. So we have our original example that I showed at the very first slide when we first start talking. We have superhuman power. You can see the truth model at every location. And you can see that the data is collected in a biased manner. And I suggested before that that was important. And so here it is. Here's the original porosity distribution, the truth model for the entire area of interest. Here's the sample porosity at the 64 wells that are available. The truth mean is 10% porosity. The samples that are clustered and not representative in the manner in which they were collected 
10.5%. There's an error rate of about 5%. Is that important? Is that going to have an impact on our estimations? You bet it will. A 5% increase in oil in place, a 5% increase in um, potential volumes recovered, depending on the recovery mechanism and so forth, this could significantly change an operation. And so we got to correct for that. So let's talk about the first methodology, declustering. We'll talk about cell-based declustering. We'll have one slide to talk about polygonal declustering, and that'll be it. Cell-based declustering is a very useful way to try to assign data weights in order to account for the sampling or the clustering of the sampling of the data value of interest. What do you do? You take the area of interest, you put a mesh of regular sized cells over top of the area of interest, and then you calculate data weights based on the number of data within each cell. If there's one data in a cell, you get one weight. If you've got four data in a cell, you get one quarter weight. If you've got two data in a cell, you get half weight. You see that? It's very straightforward. Now, the way that we calculate the weights is pretty straightforward. We're going to divide the volume of interest into the cells. We're going to count the number of occupied cells. That's L0. Then we're going to calculate the number in each cell. So number of data in each cell. And then we'll weight inversely to that. The equation will look like this. The weight for that datum is going to be 1 over the number of data in the cell. So one data would be full weight. Two data would be half weight. Pretty straightforward, right? We're going to standardize that by the number of data divided by number of cells with data. By doing that, what we're doing is we're forcing the sum of the weights to be equal to n. And we're creating a concept of the nominal weight is the weight of 1.0. What's a nominal weight? That would be the case for which, imagine if this space had all of the data equally spaced. All of the data had equal spacing, and we calculate the weights with some type of declustering method, they would all get a weight of 1.0. That means that there's no locations where there's too sparse, no locations where they're too densely sampled, and so we don't need to correct. And so nominal weight is basically like that data doesn't need any correction. It's got about the right amount of spacing or density that we would expect given the size of the area of interest and the number of data. So if we have a weight of 1, you've got nominal weight, no correction. Weight of less than 1, reduced weight. The data was too clustered. Greater than 1, it means increased weight. It means it was in sparse area. So let's take that data example, remove the truth model. No longer do we have x-ray eyes. We can't see the truth. And we'll go ahead and look at the declustering weights at each data location. So at every location, you're going to have a declustering weight, not just the data value. Now you have a declustering weight. The one would be like this peach color right here, maybe right here, right here. Those are one right there. The less than one would suggest that you're overly sampled or too densely sampled in that area. And the yellow and oranges are going to be sparsely sampled. They got greater weight. Now, one thing I want to comment on is that there are many software programs that actually, or many approaches or workflows where they assume the sum of the one, the sum of the weights, excuse me, is equal to one. In that case, nominal weight is equal to 1 divided by the number of data. Why would you want to do this? Well, we'll see later on when you want to calculate a CDF directly from a weighted set of, set of data. It makes it very easy to do. It's very intuitive. And so that's why people like to use that, that scheme too. Okay, so let's look at the impact of declustering. What does data declustering do? The distribution is updated by the weights. If you think about, this is the original sample distribution. And each one of these bars is the result of equal little cells or bins that are added up to each other. In this interval right here, there was maybe two data. In this one, there was five. In this one, there was seven, and so forth. And it results in these bars. Now, the declustering is going to actually add another piece of information. We have each of the data values, but paired with them is going to be a weight based on the spatial arrangement. And so when we put the histogram together, we're now going to calculate or account for the weights. So the thickness of all those little incremental cells that add up to make the bars are going to be proportional to their weight. It's going to account for their weights. And so what, what happens? The distribution, the bars will go up 
or they'll go down, or they may stay the same if the weights are very close to one, or if you have some data with high weight, some data with low weight, and they balance out, that can happen too. What do we see systematically here? Well, I drew arrows here. If we compare the original naive distribution to the declustered distribution down here, we have increasing height here, increasing height here, decreasing height here, here, and here. In general, the low values are going up and the frequency of the high values are going down. The result is that the average is going to shift. I hope I went the right way. The average is going to shift towards the low values of porosity. Now I should mention that you might th seem this might seem like an unusual idea. You haven't heard of weighting data before. I can convince you that it is scientifically applied in a variety of different studies, uh, different scientific disciplines. And you can tell by the fact that Python matplotlib, the his function, actually allows for vector weights to be input along with the data values. So, in fact, this declustered histogram was produced using that function with the weights from cell-based declustering. Okay. Now, if you're looking at the previous discussion, you might be a little concerned at what's the influence of the cell size. And clearly, changing the cell size is going to change the result, the weights that are applied to the data. In fact, if you think about it, we could plot the declustered mean, the mean after we apply the declustering weights to the data versus the cell size. And let's do a thought experiment. What happens if the cell size is very, very small? Very, very small cell size. At that point, every single data value is going to fall into its own cell. What's the weight? Every data, own cell, everything gets full weight. If you look at the equation, it'll collapse and every single data will get weight one, equally weighted, naive. It's just the same as the regular sample distribution. Think about now if we had a very big cell, it's so big that in fact, all of the data fit into one cell. All of the data is going to get one over n times the other factor. And what you'll find out is that that was simplified to basically all of the data getting weight one again. Okay, this number of occupied cells is going to go down to one. And if you look at the equation, you'll see that it'll go to everything getting weight one again. So if we plot this, this is the naive porosity mean, the sample, naive sample mean. Over here at some large size of cell, it's going to go back up to there again. In between, it's going to fall. Why does it fall? Because specifically, we oversampled the high values. So the declustered mean decreases as we look at different cell sizes. The common practice is to select the cell size that minimizes it. the declustered mean if we have sampled preferentially the high values. If we pre sample preferentially low values, you reverse it and you take the maximizing cell size to for the declustered mean. There's no theory to indicate that this is the perfectly correct answer. It's, it's a conservative engineering type of approach where we say we know we are sampled to bias high, take the cells that will minimize to try to remove or mitigate that bias. Now, we should mention that the results can be also very sensitive to large-scale trends. And so in general, if we're trying to pick cell sizes, rather than use this approach, it would be better to choose the cell size by visual inspection, such that we are able to see that approximately one data per cell in the sparsely sampled areas, and that in the locations with denser sampling, that they now start to become more than one sample per cell. So that's typically the approach. You might also be concerned about this. If I run this approach, I have this data point right on the boundary. So it gets half weight, and then this data gets full weight. But if I was to shift that boundary just a little bit, this data point would have got half weight, and this one would have got full weight. And so there's sensitivity to the absolute location of the mesh. And so what do we do? We, we take the mesh and we perturb its location, the origin. We let it move around five, ten times, calculate the weights, and we average the result in order to get a final result. And so that's the averaging does a pretty good job of removing the influence of the location of the mesh. So we do it through offsets.
Some other comments we can make about it, there's, we're not, we are sensitive to the cell size. So we want to choose the cell size. Minimizing, maximizing declustered mean could be one approach. It's better if we can look at the data and figure it out by data configuration based on a concept of kind of the minimum nominal spacing of the data. We remove the sensitivity to the mesh location by averaging over multiple mesh pertur perturbations or locations. We have little, almost no sensitivity to the data boundary. And so we have another methodology that we can use if we're concerned about that. It may be that this boundary of the data set is important. In fact, it's very well known. It's not uncertain. You know the phenomenon has this boundary. Then you might want to work polygonal-based declustering. What do we do with polygonal-based declustering? Is we're going to split the area of interest with Voronoi partitioning, a tessellation, in fact. And so we break up the area of interest into these polygons. Now, how do we formulate those polygons? We do, we intersect perpendicular bisectors between old adjacent data. So we have adjacent data, perpendicular bisector, adjacent data, perpendicular bisector, and so forth, and you intersect them up and you will get these polygons. Another way to look at them is that this polygon is actually providing a boundary around all of the locations for which this data is the closest data. So that's pretty useful, a good way to think about it. Okay, so what do we do? How do we get a weight? Easy. We get the area of the polygon associated to each data, or datum I should say, then we divide it by the total area in the area of interest. If we do that, we'll now get a set of weights that will sum to one. You might not like that, not a big deal. Multiply that area associated to the datum divided by the total area, multiply it by n. And now we'll get a weight that have a nominal weight of one and sum to n. This method is very sensitive to the boundary. Just imagine right now if we redrew the boundary over here. Now this polygon would be something like that. Look at that area right there. That area would become massive. And now imagine I keep expanding, keep expanding to even larger and larger, and the weights on the periphery data are going to be very sensitive to where that boundary is located. Imagine if I wrap the boundary very close to the data, it would, it would definitely shrink their weight significantly. So this type of approach of polygonal-based declustering or an area-based weighting is actually very common. It's, it's been used all over the place in other scientific disciplines. Hydrology uses it when they have irregularly sampled measurements of rainfall to figure out what the average rainfall is. And so many, many scientific disciplines use this approach. And so it's a good way to get a spatially representative statistic. Now, so what statistics are we going to be concerned with? What can we calculate with weights? And the answer is all of them. We can calculate any statistic we want using weights. So take the sample mean. Here it is. The estimate of the mean is just equal to the sum of the weights multiplied by the data divided by the sum of weights. Now, if this looks confusing to you, just imagine what would happen if every single weight was equal to 1, like we do when we're not weighting. In that case, we have 1 times the data, so this collapses to just become the data, the summation of the data, and we would divide by n. This, in fact, would be the regular sample mean that we're used to calculating. Now we can extend that. We can calculate a sample variance right here. And notice the only difference now is that we're weighting every single one of these by the weight applied to each of the data. And we're dividing by 1 divided by some of the weights to minus 1. So we're counting for degrees of freedom. The covariance. The covariance can be calculated just like before, but we can wait. And we can apply a weighting to the covariances. Okay, so pretty straightforward. We can do this type of weighting with any statistic. The CDF, take the CDF. If we have the sum of the weights equal to 1, then in fact, the CDF FZ of Z is going to be, we could just approximate it as the sum of all the weights of all the data that were less than that threshold. Pretty straightforward, okay? So uh, not too bad. So we can calculate all the statistics we want given these de declustering weights. And so that's good. Now we have representative statistics that we can use for all of our decision making, all of our map modeling. We now have spatially representative statistics. 
Now, I will provide this in a separate lecture, but um, if you are interested, there are workflows for declustering using GSLib and also for using the Python approach, which is the PyGSLib approach. Those workflows are put together in Jupyter Notebooks and are available on GitHub. So just go along to my, um, if you're interested, go to GitHub Geostat Guy and I have a Python numerical methods directory with two different declustering workflows in, note, in Python notebooks. And so links are available right here for them. The one based on GeoSlide uses the geostat pi functions that I developed that basically just run GeoSlide executables, but streamline the workflows. Now, of course, the problem with that, it's a very incomplete form of wrapping. It's just writing the parameter files, running the executables, reading the results back in means that it only works on Windows. You've got to have all the GS Live executables. Not a big deal if you have a Windows machine because those executables are available online for free. I believe it also could be run in Linux too because the executables are available on Linux. I have not heard of them available on Mac and somebody needs to get around to compiling that. I don't know why. Here's a workflow that uses PyGS Live, which is very useful because they've done a proper job of wrapping GS Live so the Fortran, Fortran code is properly wrapped, and so this will work on any platform, and it's much cleaner. And so this is the workflow using them. Thank you very much, the author of PyGS Live. Adrian, appreciate all your work. Okay, so comments on cell-based declustering. Just a couple of comments. Um, I should acknowledge th this, and this has come from a previous slide from Clayton Deutsch, and I apologize, I should have the recognition here. But... We, if we are going to perform declustering, if we have vertical wells, the problem does collapse to a 2D problem. Because we've got all these vertical wells in space, we would expect that every data value along that well should all have equal weight. There's no difference in their clustering along the well. So the problem is as long as all the wells go all the way through the unit of interest, we have a two-dimensional problem. If you have three-dimensional, three-dimensional problem, it would be because you have data that is along trajectories that's not just vertical, they're horizontal, they're highly deviated wells, and so forth, and then you'd have to deal with the full three-dimensionality of the problem. The shape of the cells that you should use, I showed examples where they're just isotropic, right? They're just squares. They could have anastropy on them, they could have different dimensions in each direction, that would definitely be that, that sorry that would be in the case in which the data sample spacing has preferential directions and we would do that to account for that preferential sampling okay couple of okay so now let's talk about the motivation for spatial debiasing and then we'll finish up don't worry there's not much left here just a couple more slides what do we do when there's too few data or there's not data at all you know it's not representative of the entire distribution. Okay, so the declustering method, what we do is we're weighting the data so we can go from the naive histogram, which is white, to the shaded one by changing the weights. So we change the height of the bars, but you notice the bars don't move. They don't, actually don't move, they just change in height. I offset them so you could see them, but they're, they're not moving. What do we do if we just never sampled porosity above 11.5% or we just have so few data that we can't even see the bars, we can't see the histogram really? De declustering can only change the data weights. It can't change the bars. It can't change, it can't change the location of the bars. It can't fill in missing information. So we would need some type of debiasing to deal with this problem. So let's get let's take an example right here. So we have a structure that is an anticline structure. What's that mean? That this is the shallowest part of the structure. This is the deepest part of the structure along the peripheries. We've only sampled the crest of the structure, the very shallow parts, and the porosity is all pretty high. But we suspect that the porosity is going to decrease with depth. So if you plot the data we have, we have the wells right here. We have not sampled at the greater depths. And now we want a porosity distribution or mean or variance that's representative of this entire structure. Well, what do we have? 
we have the porosity and depth at the shallow depths. We have the knowledge of a porosity depth relationship, a linear compaction trend drawn by these contours right here. And we know the depth at each location. That's easy to get. In fact, we're really fortunate. We just have that because you can image the structure. You know how deep it is. So how do we use this information, the bias data, the relationship between that bias sample set and a secondary variable, and the knowledge of the secondary variable at all locations in order to fix the problem? It's really a calibration type of approach. We model the relationship between, the, between depth and porosity at the depths for which we have it available. And we model that as a conditional distribution. Then we extrapolate the conditional distribution using the linear trend relationship between them, depth and porosity. Then we can use the knowledge about depth over all possible locations, not over where we just sampled it. That's where the blue is just where we have samples. No, we use it over the green, which is all locations we have it. And we can then propagate that through. We got a marginal, we got a conditional, and we go through to get the other marginal, not just the blue one, which is the sample, the biased sample data, but to infer, infer it for all possible locations for which we have depth. That's what we're going to do. So we extrapolate that conditional distribution, then we feed or propagate from the marginal, knowing the density of all of the possible depths, to get to the representative porosity distribution. So we're going to the steps once again. We map the secondary variable for all locations. So now we have the full secondary data distribution in green. We develop the bivariate relationship between the secondary and the primary data, depth and the porosity. And we generate the distribution, the, tr the more representative distribution of the primary of porosity by combining all the secondary distributions. What does it look like? We're going to calculate the marginal PDF of porosity, and we're going to do it. The marginal PDF of porosity is the integration over all depths of the conditional porosity given depth multiplied by the F and Z DZ. What's this? This is the PDF. This is the increments on the PDF. So this is effectively the probability of being within an interval of depth multiplied by the conditional associated with that interval. That's exactly what we're doing. So we're propagating the marginal through the conditional to get this marginal on, on this side. Very, very powerful method. Now, my students have asked for an Excel example of this. I'll put one together later today. And I will post that. I may post the video, but for sure, I'll get that up on GitHub. It'll be under my Geostats Guy numerical, Excel numerical demos. Does declustering matter? Oh, you bet it does. No matter where you look, you take a data set, you perform cell-based declustering, polygonal-based declustering, you will often see a change. And so here's an example of unconventional production rates from the Haynesville, the Barnett, the Fayetteville. These are the naive distributions. And when we apply declustering, cell-based declustering, carefully, we're finding a reduction in the mean production of about four, five, or eight percent. I often see five to ten percent, sometimes fifteen percent change in the average as I do declustering. I should mention, is declustering guaranteed to give you the right answer every time? There's no guarantee. In fact, you could put together a pathological data case in which you could cook it so that declustering would make it worse. But on average, an expectation, you'll find that declustering applied in an expert manner Will result in result will result in statistics that are closer to the population statistics and reduce the sampling bias due to the way that we're sampled. All right, that was our discussion, our motivation for why we need to debias and decluster. Declustering type of technologies, cell based and polygonal, were discussed, and how do we debias using a secondary piece of information that's easier to get, that's more exhaustively available and the relationship between the primary and the secondary to map from a marginal to the conditional back through to the needed marginal. All right, once again, I hope that this was a useful discussion for you. 
I'm Michael Perch, a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also the Geostats guy on Twitter and GitHub and YouTube, and I'm easy to find, and I'm always happy to talk Geostats if you have any questions. Thank you.